two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James Blatch and Mark Dawson. And uh, this week we have a guest who's going to talk uh, about launching in particular. And he's a bit of a name in the indie industry and he also appears on a rival podcast, not really a rival podcast, but an alternative podcast in our space and one that I like listening to because it's about writing a book. And Tim is in the process of writing a book uh, with Sean Coyne. Tim? Did I say Tim? What did I say? You said Tim. Uh, Tim Grohl. Tim Grohl, yes. We haven't announced his name. Oh, yes, Tim Grohl. Yes, who is Tim? <laughs> Tim Grohl is going to be the guest. Good good spot. Thank you very much. Uh, so next time I'll introduce you first and then me, because you obviously know more about what's going on. So Tim is in a podcast with Sean Coyne, who is, of course, the author of The Story Grid, um, a book I've referenced a couple of times. And it's a bit of my go-to book at the moment. And he's going through this process with Tim. It's a fascinating listen. I mean, it's hard work for Tim. And I'm, I'm doing a very similar thing with my author now, because I really like the process, my editor. I like the process he's going through. So each chapter, each scene, as uh, Sean calls them, um, comes back. And, and Tim's been here. He mentions this in the interview on some of the scenes. He had to rewrite them three or four times until Sean is happy that they mean something. They're purposeful and they have a, a role in the book. So I've actually contacted my editor uh, a little while ago and said, look, this, because I'm writing my first book and learning the craft, this is how I'd like to work with her chapter by chapter. She's a bit reticent about that because her view is, well, the book's got to flow from beginning to end and she wants to be able to take a broad view of it, but she's a, a willingly gone along with it. And um, so I've just got the feedback back from um, a rewritten, second time rewritten first chapter and moving on uh, from there. And the chapter's gone from, I think it was about 12,000 words to 29,000 words now. It's a significantly different chapter. 29,000 word chapter. Yeah, it's a big chapter. Well, it's not, it's a part, oh, that's really, because my book yes. is in days By of days, the week. So yes. there's, there's times within that which effectively are mini chapters yeah. within it. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a good way, really, at the beginning of your career, if you can get an editor and do this and say to them, let's work together as I write this book. Rather, it's a rather odd way of thinking about it to write an entire book, 90,000 words or whatever it is, then hand it over, only for them to say, well, it doesn't really work here, here and here. Mm -hmm. Why not do it as you go along and then learn through that process? And then ultimately, you've got a finished book that then could go, for instance, to a new editor. Now, I know this is an expensive way of doing it. The way I look at it is as an investment in my future, my career, it's a bit like taking a college course, a lot cheaper than becoming a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and we'll see how it goes from there. Anyway, that's not really what we've got Tim on because Tim is becoming a bit of an expert in launching strategies. He's a digital guy, digital marketing guy, really nice, uh, and interesting guy to talk to. So we thought it'd be useful to have him along for that. Yeah, I, I first came across Tim, I guess, in three or four years ago when he was um, doing promotion for his book, which I can't remember the name of now, which is terribly, um, terribly bad of me, but that will be in the show notes. It's um, your first thousand copies, I think, something yeah, like those something, lines. Yeah. Um, so he was on, let me think, I think probably on Joanna Penn's podcast, and um, I immediately was drawn to him. He's very um, open. He's got a very nice voice. Yeah, yes. um, he talks very clearly. He's got a nice, nice beard as well. He does have watching. a very nice beard, um, and... And he speaks speaks a lot of sense. Um, so he um, and he until recently, I think he may have stopped this now. But he had a podcast about book launching as well, which was very interesting. Um, he breaks it down really well, um, and I've learned plenty from 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 Tim. Um, and I thought it'd be good to have him on to talk about launching, especially because it wasn't that long ago that I launched the the new Milton book, and yeah. I'll have another launch not too far away from now. And and it's always it's great to you know bring in people and try and learn. New, even if they're small little tweaks that might mean an extra 20 copies sold if you can get 10 of those tweaks that's 200 copies and that could be the difference between a very good launch and an extremely good launch so um, really good to get him on and you know, kudos to you I know it was a difficult one in terms of quality that, yeah. that sound needed lots of work but it's, it sounds really good now it's a really excellent interview um, and I think one that listeners will get a lot out of okay let's hear from Tim So for the last eight years, I've been working with authors, helping them build their online platform, connect with readers and sell more books, um, worked with uh, hundreds of different authors um, across all the all genres, indie, traditional publishing, fiction, nonfiction, 
uh, launched a lot of books, um, uh, several dozen bestsellers, a uh, couple of number one New York Times bestsellers, um, and done a lot of the behind the scenes online marketing platform building for a lot of well-known authors. Um, and then in the past, like almost two years, I've transitioned more to teaching online than, um, than it's more like it was before it was like 80% client work, 20% teaching. And now that's kind of switched around. And, uh, and then along with that, for about the past almost a year and a half, I've been doing a podcast with uh, Sean Coyne of StoryGrid, where he's teaching me how to write fiction. And so each week we do an episode where we just uh, talk about how to write fiction and he's helping me write a book. Um, so those are the two main things I'm doing right now. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I should well, have a better pitch than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a long elevator ride, but, um, no, yeah. that's, um, uh, yeah, we, we know that you're a busy man and there's a congruence, I think in our podcast because, uh, Mark's an experienced writer and, uh, an experienced, very experienced marketer is one of the guys who's really sort of cracked the marketing side as well and thinks a lot about that, uh, and we'll talk about that because obviously that's your area as well in a moment. And I'm the newbie writer who's learning. And uh, funnily enough, in fact, I've probably got it here. I never have it very far away. Is uh, is my copy of the Story Grid? You oh see yeah, all my notes and marks. You've got you've got one close as well. Yeah, yeah I got mine too. <laughs> and it's um, it's funny how many people uh, use it. It's a fantastic book. It's I guess I you, know, you read a book like uh, like that, and, and Sean is um is direct in the way that he teaches and he writes and he says this is and i love the way he sort of says you know you can not understand how this process works and do it differently if you want good luck with that it won't work this is what you need to do and um that's kind of what i need you need and it makes sense yeah. that, that, that there's there's a way stories work right there's a way stories work now you can go off beat and you can be uh ian McEwen or whatever and do do things very differently but you've got to understand from the beginning and that's what i i think a lot of people have come into contact with you through that process through that podcast and, and sean's world um and we'll talk about uh, we are going to talk about marketing i promise but from the story point of view i'm interested to know about your journey how how are you does it all making sense to you now sean rubbing off yeah it's uh it's coming together it's it's been a really hard process to enter into for a couple different reasons. Um, the first is, you know, when we started doing this, I was already an expert at something, you know, uh, at book marketing and book launches. I already knew how to do that. And so for several years, I felt very comfortable talking about it and would be on podcasts to talk about it and wrote a couple books on it. Very comfortable, uh, felt like an expert, you know. And so moving into just a complete beginner mindset again, and then the way that we are doing it is, uh, you know, recording our conversations live. Um, and we never discuss uh, uh, anything before we do the episode. So when he critiques my scenes, that's the first I've heard, you know, so um, it's, you know, pretty uh, hard to hear that stuff. And then also knowing that, you know, it's going to go out and thousands of people are going to hear him rip apart my scenes. But, um, but it's, uh, so it's been emotionally challenging just to like enter into something as just a complete newbie and do it in a way where like um, a lot of times when you're new at something, you kind of hide from experts, you know, because you don't you know, it's bad. So you don't really you're not ready to hear what they have to say. Um, so I can't do that with Sean. And then knowing that it's going out into the world, um, you know, and it's not good is hard, but it's starting to come together. I'm starting to understand the flow of stories. Um, and like even I just uh, every year. My wife and I have like the Christmas movies we watch. And so uh, we were we were watching The Family Man, uh, the Nicolas Cage movie from like 15 years ago. We watched that this weekend. And like as the story is unfolding, I'm like ticking off all of the scenes and the turns and everything that has to happen in every story. And uh, so I'm starting to see it out in the world, um, which means I'm starting to write it in the, into my story as well. Um, but 
so far we're only 11 like i've been working on this book since the beginning of the year and he's only approved 11 scenes and i've written over 100 uh so you know i don't know like it, it's seriously i had just told my friend uh about a month ago like Hey, you know, Sean's finally letting me not just write one scene at a time, but like three scenes at a time. And then the next episode we recorded, he made me stop writing. Uh, and I wasn't allowed to write for like three weeks and still we figured something else out, you know. So um, it's definitely a series of ups and downs, but uh, it's been a really good process. And it's been... Um, uh, very cathartic, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, to kind of do it in this systematic public way. Um, and I've, we've just gotten so much feedback. Um, I get emails weekly from people that are like, you ask all the questions I'm, I'm afraid to ask. Or like, you know, when you said that, like, man, I think that all the time. And so I feel like it's been really good for writers listening to it to realize they're not alone um and to realize like you're not the only one thinking these questions you think are stupid um and it's just uh it's, so it's been a you know we're almost a year and a half i guess in and um you know we'll just keep going until the book's done i guess <laughs> yeah well it's um it's a process that gets more difficult as it goes on for me i i think writing the writing badly is easy and writing <laughs> writing mediocre is quite hard, and writing good is really hard. I mean, who knew that writing a book was difficult? It should have, presumably everyone would be writing books if it was easy. But I'm I'm a bit like you in terms of the process, and I've had my editorial feedback, and I I kind of knew half of what she was going to say. I knew uh, in in the back yeah. of my mind, and um, the other half was was illuminating and put me in the right direction. And now I'm writing much more slowly than I used to as well. I used to rattle out words really quickly, but now I'm every sentence I'm thinking, does it work? Why am I writing this? Where are we going? <laughs> you know, it's and it slowed me up. But I'm, yeah. I, I don't know about you. I'm still really enjoying it, but I find it. I find it harder and more difficult to plan my sessions of writing, whereas before I dive in and write, now I need to know I've got two hours to sit and do it in a row. I can't just do 10 minutes, which I used to be able to do. Yeah, I've found, um, I don't know. I don't know if I've figured out a rhythm yet because the other thing, the thing that's different about this um, is that we, you know, we record every week. And so, my pacing is set off of the podcast more than the work I can get done. Cause some weeks they'll give me stuff to do and it'll only take me an hour, but then I don't get his feedback for a week. So my pacing's a little weird and I'll stop writing for three weeks when we're like figuring something out and I'm not ready. And he hasn't kind of released me to write yet. So that's been a little weird. Um, it's great to have but, that because one of the things that all of us face is that challenge of, of, of getting the stuff done and making progress. And although you say it's a bit weird some weeks when you don't do very much, on the other hand, there are weeks where you've got to do it. You can't, you can't turn up to yeah. the podcast without it done, right? So. Right, exactly. It is a kind of a fire uh, behind me you know, to get me going and sit down and write because I know I, you know, I need to turn in these three scenes. So he has time to look over them before we do the podcast. Um, but uh, it's also, I, we talked about this at one point in one of the shows, but I think what has helped me progress so fast compared to a lot of writers is the, is the short feedback loop. So if you look into, if you read a book like uh, Cal Newport's So Good They Can't Ignore You, or you look at like, um, uh, what is it, Anderson, uh, Anderson something he wrote, he, it was the research that Malcolm Gladwell based his book um, Outliers on. Um, oh man. Anyway, he talks about uh, deliberate practice and how important deliberate practice is to learning something. And one of the hallmarks of deliberate practice is what they call short feedback loops. And the problem with a lot of writing is somebody will sit down and churn out you know, an 80,000 word manuscript 
before anybody ever sees it. So they've worked on this thing for months and months, and then they get feedback. And that causes two problems. One is that means whatever mistakes you're making, you've made over the course of 80,000 words instead of one scene, 1,500 words or something. Um, and it's too much feedback to give somebody at once to be like your entire book is a disaster. And so I think what has helped me is I write 1500 words, I turn it in, he critiques it, I go back, I write 1500 words, he critiques it, and it just shortens this feedback loop where like one, there was one point I wrote one scene like five times before he approved it. But like each time it got better and I fixed new things. So then those were all mistakes I won't make in future scenes. You know what I mean? Where if you're making those mistakes in scenes, like if you're not turning a scene and you write 60 scenes and 53 of them don't turn, like that's a disaster. But if I just write one scene that doesn't turn and he's like, well, you got to make this turn. And then I go back and make it turn. He's like, well, it turned, but you didn't do the middle build good enough. And so I go back and fix that. And, and then, you know, I'm learning in this shorter loop than most writers learn, which is over, you know, months. And yeah. Months. And that, that, that with the way you spell it out is a, makes complete sense for the way that editors should work with writers. I mean, in almost every other field of instruction, that's how it works. You don't learn to fly. You don't go off for a month by yourself on the plane, then come back and the instructor starts to take you through what you did a month ago. You would all be dead. Well, and, and writing's different than other creative. So if you compute, compare it to like music, um, if you're learning an instrument, you know immediately when you play a note wrong. You know, you know immediately when you miss a beat on the drums. Like it's, it's a pretty quick feedback loop, even without a teacher. And the problem with writing is you don't have that immediate feedback loop. Like you can sit in your room and keep making the mistake over and over and over. And it's really hard to see on your own. Um, so that's what I think uh, has made such a big difference. Because if you go back to like fall of 2015, I forgot exactly what episode it was, probably around 10 or 12. And you read my first scene I ever turned into him. And then you compare it to the scenes I'm writing now. Like it's night and day difference. Um, they're just legitimately better. I mean, they're, you know, they're not the best written thing out there. But the amount of progress I've made in a year is really strong. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how many editors will start offering their services in, and in, in caveating it in that way. I mean, I've got my editors basically do that having sort of fed off of Sean yourself and also in, in my initial conversation with her, which was an hour long and going over, you know, the whole book. And now we're in a position where I do a chapter, send it to her and we talk about it and then I move yeah. on. So I'm um, not quite scene by scene, but certainly that, and it, it's a, and it was her suggestion to start off with and it's worked so much better, but that seems to me as an editor, a service they should offer from the beginning rather than, you know, your seven hundred dollar check at the end or whatever for doing it, but say to somebody, I'll have seven hundred dollars, but pay me thirty dollars a session for <laughs> two years or whatever, and let's let's work together on the book. I don't know I don't know how many editors offer that service. I mean it's the way Sean works with people I know, but Yeah, well and it's interesting because I don't I don't know. Like I've I'm not I never have worked like in the publishing industry. I've never worked with an editor outside of getting my nonfiction book edited. So I don't really know what the pro from what I understand the process is the the author writes this book um, and tries to get an agent. And if that doesn't work, maybe they try to get an editor to help them rework the book. But again, you're trying to re rework this giant tomb, you know, instead of like just a little bit. Um, and I'm, you know, I think a lot of authors have done this with like short stories and submitting short stories and working on them that way. Uh, but I don't, this is, I've never tried or like I had done a couple of NaNoWriMo's, but besides that, I had never tried to write fiction before me and Sean started together. So I don't know what the normal way yeah. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, well I think it's I think it's at the end of the book you get an editor and you rewrite and you rewrite and so on. But anyway, it is changing and um Sean and yourself are helping that. So let's um let's talk about marketing because that's principally okay. what we talk about on the uh, on the SPF podcast, although there is quite a lot of writing elements into it. Now I know that you're um say you're transitioning into um sort of 
from coaching, I guess, individual writers through to online instruction and so on. And I've seen this quite a few, uh, a few weeks ago, um, I was looking through your sort of YouTube stuff and videos. There's quite a lot of you teaching live audiences. I don't know if that was just mm -hmm. for the video or you do these live sessions with, with writers. It looked really gripping anyway, the way you were talking to them. <laughs> No, I did a creative live segment, um, so I think that's what you probably came across. Um, I still do one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, it's just uh, not as much as I used to. It allows me. I'm basically working with authors over longer periods of time instead of just kind of you know helping them one off. Um, and then, yeah, just working with them to help them figure out how to leverage their platform to launch their books mainly. Okay, so what what are the sort of things? I mean, what what state are authors coming to you in? And in terms of of how you're then packaging up your teaching, which is going to go to a non specific audience, a wide audience, what are the key things you're starting with? So you know what I always start with is looking at what assets they the author currently has, um, and that will help me determine the kind of advice I give. So, you know, if you're an author that comes to me with an email list of 100,000 and like your best friends with top podcasters, like that's going to be a different type of launch than if you're like, I finished my book, I started a blog, but nobody reads it. What am I going to do? You know, those are two different types of advice. And actually, like one is, you know, you're going after your bestseller list and the other is you're just playing the long game. And so, uh, but no matter what kind of launch you're doing, I always am looking at three things, which is uh, how do you get uh, fans to buy the book? How do you get fans to share the book? And then how do you get influencers to help you promote the book? And the way that I define those two terms, you know, I always try to start broad so we can, you know, think overarching strategy first before any kind of tactics. Um, you know, I, I just think of fans are people that are going to buy a copy of your book and influencers are people that are going to get other people to buy a copy of your book. So they're influencing other people's buying decisions. So your fans are people you're directly connected with. So there are people following you on Facebook, Twitter, you know, social media, there are people on your email list. They're the people that when you say, Hey, I have a new book at book out, they're going to go buy a copy. And then the other group is the influencers. Uh, so that's like you or somebody else with a podcast or a blog or whatever. Um, you have a following and you influence other people's buying decisions. And so getting you to help me promote my book will not just sell one copy. It's going to sell 50 copies or 100 or 1,000 copies. Um, and then you just start kind of working both of those sides of the equation. And uh, you're trying to make it really easy for fans to buy your book and give them a really good reason to buy it right now. Uh, and then you're working with influencers uh, to make it in their best interest to help you promote the book. And there's, you know, a hundred different ways to do each of those. But I find that kind of starting high level and breaking it down into those two groups help you to kind of see, you know, you're going to interact differently with those groups, right? With your fans, you're going to interact more in a one to many, right? You're going to send an email to your entire list where influencers, you're going to interact with them one on one. You know, you're going to email with them directly. You're going to, you know, text them or, you know, how, how whatever your relationship is. Um, and if you're lining everything up for one big launch where you're trying to push a bunch of sales in the same week, you just plan everything out so that all those sales hit that first week. And do you work in specific genres or do people come to you with, across the uh, board? I've worked across the board, you know, so I've worked with uh, a lot of indie fiction writers. So probably my most well known is uh, I worked with Hugh Howey through his Wool books um, and, um, and a couple of the others. And then uh, I've worked with Michael Bunker on the release of his books. And, you know, when people are like, well, this stuff doesn't work, you know, for fiction, I'm like, well... I worked with a guy that writes Amish science fiction, and if it works for Am Amish science fiction, it will literally work for anything. And you know, as I helped him with his launch, he sold fifty thousand copies of his book in the first six months. And so, um, uh, a lot of my work has been in nonfiction. 
Uh, but I've worked, you know, across the board uh, to help, you know, because 80% of the advice for nonfiction and fiction is exactly the same. Um, and so, the, again, the biggest thing is identifying people that you're connected to and giving them a really good reason to buy right now. Um, so, I mean, if we were talking specific strategies, you know, one of the main things I look at is, uh, you know, one of the biggest triggers to get people to buy is scarcity, right? So um, that's why, you know, Macy's is always running a sale. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, if you don't buy by Friday, the price is going to go up. So it has to be scarcity of the price is going to go up or you're not going to be able to buy this product. Like you, when you do your product launches, you know, the cart closes and it's not available anymore. And that's what triggers people to buy. And the problem with books is um, they are kind of by definition around forever, right? So once you launch the book, they're on Amazon. And so you kind of have to create scarcity around it. And so normally what I do is we put together some kind of bonus package where it's like, if you buy the book by this date, I'm going to give you these three other books, or I'm going to give you this workbook, or I'm going to give you these three downloads or this video series. And basically look at how you can add value to the book and promise people if they buy the book by such and such date, you're going to give them all of these extra bonuses. And so that creates that scarcity so that everybody will buy your book right now instead of putting it on their Amazon wish list with the other 382 books they haven't read yet. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do is get, and then we promote that bonus package to all of your fans. So your email list, uh, your Facebook group, your you know Twitter followers, you know wherever you have a direct connection to your fan base, you promote your book in this bonus through those different avenues. And are you teaching a lot of advertising? I know you're having a dip into um, a look through our Facebook ads course at the moment. And is, is social media advertising or paid advertising a big part of what you teach? Or do you use, are you more organic uh, advice? Yeah, I don't do very much on the Facebook advertising or other types of advertising. Um, in most cases, you know, most people are making roughly two bucks a book when they're selling their book, right? So uh, especially when you're traditionally published, that's like a rough number. So every book you sell, you're making $2. It's really hard to like make your ROI on paid advertising work when you're only making $2 per conversion. Now, what I look at, I always have a long game approach. So I want to build my email list. I'm sure you guys have talked about building email lists on this podcast before, so I'm not going to just like harp on that except to agree with other people that it's your number one asset. So my goal is um, before my book comes out, I'm building an email list. And then when I launch a book, I use that email list to launch the book and get it out into the world and promote it and sell a bunch of copies. But then I keep building my email list. So the next time I come out with a book, my email list is gonna be even bigger. And then the next time I come out with a book is gonna be even bigger. So when my first book came out, I had 1800 email subscribers. When my second book came out, I had 12,000. And by the time my next one will come out, I'm gonna have probably 60,000 people on my email list. And so you wanna just keep growing it so that over time, uh, each launch becomes more and more successful just off of your direct platform that you own the access to your fan base. So I do not like um, relying on advertising. I don't like relying on publicity. These are all things that you don't have control of. I like to own the access to my fans and I can download my email list and I can go somewhere else and email them somewhere else. And unless you own your list, your direct access to fans, you could lose it at any time. You know, several years ago, uh, Facebook made a big change to how they handled pages. And all these people that had built these huge platforms on Facebook overnight, like lost huge access to those fans. And that's because they built it on somebody else's property. And so I'm always looking at the long-term game. You know, I'm, an, I'm a writer. I'm not somebody that wrote a book once. I'm 35 years old. I got a lot of writing left in me. And so I'm constantly looking at like, how do I keep building my platform? How do I keep building my email list, keep growing what I'm doing? And then along the way, I'm launching books as I write them. And each one's going to be more successful than the last. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, you can never talk about the uh, mailing list being your key asset enough, really. It's uh, uh, we're never yeah. going to tire of making it clear to people. And there are still, you know, we often observe this fact that there are people in our community who think this is getting saturated, everybody's doing the same thing. But that's only because they're the same people Paying as we attention. are listening to these yeah. podcasts. There's, there's yeah. a, a million other people out there who say, what's a mailing list? And, um, right, exactly. So there's a lot of growth uh, left in that. Okay, let's. Well, I have a great article. If people are struggling with like how to get their mailing list set up, just Google like uh, email marketing or author email marketing for authors, and I have an article that'll pop up that will walk you through. Like, I have no idea what an email list is, all the way to your first 100 subscribers. That's great. And uh, TimGroll.com, I think, is probably still your your main home on the internet. Yeah, it's actually changed to booklaunch.com. Ah, okay. Okay, booklaunch.com. There you go. It's a little easier to spell. (laughs) Yeah, everyone puts the L in the wrong place, (laughs) I guess. Um, Let's talk about nonfiction for a bit then, because uh, we often get get asked, does this stuff work for nonfiction? And uh, I remember Joanna Penn famously said on this podcast, it's so much easier for nonfiction because you've got a lot of other avenues. You've got courses and live tuition and all the rest of it. Uh, was fiction you were face- basically here uh, in one place but nonetheless you are really non-fiction has been your your focus up until the whole sean coin thing and that's been an area you've had a lot of success with your book uh mm-hmm. is is well read and well regarded so that was something did you discover this by yourself all this stuff in the early days or did you see somebody else doing something and you thought i could do that so it started Oh, geez, like eight years ago, I was um, just a freelance web developer. And this guy named Ramit Sethi uh, was running this site. He still runs it called I will teach you to be rich.com. And he needed some like technical help with the website. So I started working with him right around the time he got his book contract. And so I was doing a lot of the nuts and bolts behind the scenes leading up to the book launch. And I was kind of thinking during the book launch, like it would, it wouldn't do very well because he was like 24 or something and, uh, had like had no publicist was not doing any traditional media was not doing any of these things. And then we launched his book and with just his blog and email list, he put himself on the New York times and wall street journal list in the first week. And I was like, well, damn, like how'd he pull that off? And so, um, I started working with some other authors and I started working with authors like Dan Pink and Guy Kawasaki and Pamela Slim and uh, Tim Sanders and like, uh, you know, Dan and Chip Heath and like all these kind of big name authors. And I basically would, I would like go to them and convince them to hire me mainly so I could try out ideas with their platform. Right? Well, so how, how are you on the technical had, side as a, as a developer? Or, or how are you in a sort of... Yeah, well, and I would come to them and I would like say, hey, you know, you should be building an email list. And they're like, okay, I don't know how to do that. I said, well, hire me to do that. And then all of a sudden, I would have an email list that was 40, 50, 60,000 people. And I could try out all my ideas to see if they actually worked. And so uh, I just started literally like... I would get hired to do book marketing or author marketing and then I would like come up with new ideas and just kind of start throwing them out there to see what would work and what wouldn't because you can hear all of this advice and like there's just so I mean I cannot I cannot overemphasize the amount of bullshit advice that is on the internet about like social media marketing and building Facebook pages and all this just complete shit that does not work. It doesn't work. Well, it works kind of like I can walk from the East Coast to the West Coast of America. Like I could. Now that's like the worst way to travel, but like I could get there eventually. And so I was always looking for what are the 20, what's the thing that's going to get me the, do put in 20% of the work and get 80% of the results. And I want to find those levers. And so like one launch, um, we, I had an email list of 50,000 and a Twitter, the author had, uh, uh, an email list of 50,000, a Twitter following of thousand. And I just tested it. I'm like, how many books do we sell through Twitter? And how many books do we do we sell through um, email? And lo and behold, 
uh, a, a, an email subscriber during that launch was 12 times more likely to actually buy a book. And so now I can actually go out and say Twitter is a complete waste of time. Uh, and so, and again, a lot of people use these tools for the wrong thing. Like I believe things like Twitter and Facebook are more one-on-one uh, -on -one tools uh, than they are. We try to treat them as like mass communication and they're just not because people ignore their Twitter feed. Uh, they like they basically like dip into this fire hose where Twitter and Facebook can be good for one on one communication to directly connect with somebody you're trying to connect with. Um, and so this stuff that I found, it was like I would go out and I would like ask people that I thought were smart. I'd read stuff online. I'd get ideas and I'd come back and I would just try them. And what's different about what I was doing, and this is where also a lot of typical advice on book marketing doesn't work, is I'll read these books by these authors that are super well-meaning um, because they're like, hey, I did this thing and it worked really well for me. And it was like, well, that's great. It worked for you, but that doesn't mean that's a replicable thing. Like I can't, if I do that, it may not work. Um, I read this, I read, the, I, I read this one book on book marketing one time and like, I'm reading through this and like, they're giving all this advice and I'm like, well, I've done that. That doesn't sell very many books. I've done that. That doesn't sell many books. And then lo and behold, the thing that actually sold a lot of books for them is this big name blogger accidentally came across his book on Amazon, read it, loved it, wrote one blog post about it and sold like 5,000 copies. Right. And I'm like. You can't replicate that. Like, yeah. <laughs> so why are you writing a book giving it advice when 90% of the advice like results in 10% of your sales? Like that's and but people don't know the difference. And so what I've done is I've worked with like one on one with hundreds of authors trying this stuff just over and over and over because I don't want something that's personality based like if somebody's a big, like outgoing extrovert and they're a natural marketer, like that's great for them and I'm glad it works, but like that's not gonna work for most people. So like, I don't want anything that's personality based. I don't want anything um, that is a flash in the pan that will work for a short period of time and then go away. Like I wanna figure out what are the tried and true things that if I just do these two things every week over time, my success is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And so that's where a lot of my advice comes from. You know, most of my advice is stop doing 90% of what you're doing and just do like two things. And then those will work over time. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I got on a rant there. No, no, it was good. It was good. And it was interesting. The, you, you mentioned the guy who actually, when you looked at it, all his sales came because he happened to get um, uh, an interest of a big blogger. But actually that is something you teach as part of your strategy. Now your influencers, which I think, and um, we talk about um, the list I think people are familiar with. I think the influences is one of those areas reaching out to people like that, that some people find a bit of a hurdle and quite difficult. But in that example, you see it can be a very powerful thing. Yeah. So connecting with influencers is absolutely a great way to promote your book. Um, what I was meaning in that thing is like, that just happened. Yeah, yeah. See, it was, know, it he was, didn't, he yeah. didn't mean for that to happen. Yeah. I took, I took the points, um, but so I, I it reminded at, me. But yeah. Yeah. So, you know, connecting with influencers can be overwhelming. Uh, there's a couple of different things that I suggest for people just getting started. Um, the first is to start with uh, C list people. Right. So everybody's trying to get like Seth Godin to talk about their book or everybody's trying to get, you know, whoever these big name people to talk about their book. And so 95, I'm just making up numbers, but 95% of people are trying to get the A listers to promote their stuff. So if you go down to that B list or that C list of people, authors that are finding some success, but aren't like these big, well-known names, like connect with those people. One, they have time, you know, they're not being inundated because all the top A-listers are being inundated. Um, they're much more likely to share what they're learning with you and want to connect with you because they remember what it's like to be hungry, right? Because they're, they're six months away from being hungry. Um, and what happens is, 
you can uh, there's so there's not as much pressure to connect with them, and then you'll all grow at the same pace. And what I've found with is the people like as I've grown, you know, my influencer ranking has grown over the years. Like the people I trust now are people I've known for a long time that we knew each other when we both were nobodies. And so now I trust them and we work together on a lot of things where these people that are like coming straight to me, I'm kind of like, I don't know what their game is. Right. And so I find, and that's what I started doing is I just wanted to connect with anybody that was in my space and doing something interesting. Um, and I just kind of got over that. It, it, then if I fail, I'm not failing with Stephen King. I'm failing with like C-list author and like I can just move on with my life. The other thing, if you're trying to start in doing um, influencer outreach is doing podcasts. Um, I find uh, when I started doing outreach, like blog post, like if I was doing a guest post, I'd get super nervous and I'd put it off and never do it. Or like, God forbid, if I got a speaking engagement somewhere, like I just wouldn't eat for three weeks before I got up to speak. Um, where like podcasts are much easier because they're just a conversation. And so I just started looking on iTunes for any interview based podcast. And I would say, hey, I have this book. Uh, I'm the author of this book. I think your audience would really enjoy hearing me talk about it. Uh, could you have me on? And then I prepare nothing, right? Because we just I just show up and I, they ask me questions and I answer the questions. And so I do think it's extremely important to connect with influencers. But, you know, a lot of times people hear the word influencer and they're thinking like top, top tier influencers. And that's why I always... I'm like, we'll come back to the definition. All the definition of an influencer is they influence people's buying decisions. That could be five people. That could be 50 people. That could be 100 people. Um, you just want somebody that influences other people's buying decisions, and you can just start working with them and getting to know them. And so, you know, there's 100 different ways you could do it. But most of the time when I was new and I was nervous and I was a nobody, I would just send emails to people. And just say, hey, you know, could I be on your podcast? Or, hey, you know, I'd love to pick your brain for 20 minutes. Would you mind jumping on Skype with me? And, you know, I just have a couple questions. And if I'm starting with those people that are the B and C list people, they probably have time to talk to me. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, I, that's I, what I would recommend. Yeah. And I, I even that, I think for some authors, um, that even that can be a bit of a hurdle for them, sort of promoting themselves personally like that but it, it's an important step and again mark and i talk a lot about drawing a line whether it's a sort of lunchtime line in the day where you move from writer to businessman you just got to think dispassionately about the product that you created in the morning and how you're going to market it and that's when it gets a little bit easier to reach out to people and say let's talk about this um yeah look, and like try to remember like you love writing you love books like you love what you're doing the person you're trying to reach out to loves the exact same things as you. And so like you're, you're just connecting with somebody else that likes the same things as you, you know, I, you know, when I do the influencer side of things, I'm not like, like thinking overly strategic or like, if I can just get this one person, I'm just like, who can I connect with that? We're in the same stuff, you know, um, and that's like what I do uh, early on when I would go to conferences and stuff is I just wanted to connect to other people that were doing similar stuff to me. That's it. We go get a coffee. We go get a beer. We'd hang out. I'm not pitching them on anything. I'm just getting to know them because, again, I have the long game view, right? Because if I can connect with somebody they're going to help me for the next 30 years. I don't need to ask them to do anything today. You know, I got time for that. I just want to get to know them. And again, like when you create those, okay, it's, you're just like making friends. I mean, it's really not that over, you know, don't overthink this thing. You're just connecting with other people that are doing interesting things like you. Um, and yes, it's nerve wracking and yes, you're going to fail. And yes, people are going to say no and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, you know, if you're writing, your writing sucks and then it gets better and then you know, it sucks and then it gets better. And it's, it's just like everything else where it's just like you'll learn how to do it and you'll become more of a natural. And then you'll get to this point where it's like people start coming to you and it's a whole lot easier. Yeah. 
Great, Tim. That's been brilliant. The time has whipped past. We sort of not we've got we've <laughs> ratcheted up forty minutes on the clock, which is where we roughly try and, and make our interviews work. And uh, it's been a nice steady line. We, I think you're in Tennessee. Is that right? Or like, yeah, that's right, Nashville. You're in Nashville. Okay, you should um, have a guitar in your hand as well as a, a book. Do you play guitar? <laughs> that's right. Is that compulsory <laughs> in Nashville? Uh, I used to. Um, I'm starting to feel the itch again. We'll see what happens. Yeah, you're in the right place. Tim, brilliant. <laughs> I, I would love to talk to you again at some point because I think we barely scraped the surface, really, and it was a value-packed um, interview. So really, thank you for that and uh, all the tips. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Just tell us again where people can go to find out a little bit more about what you teach. Uh, so the main thing is to go to booklaunch.com. That's where like I have my newsletter and all my resources and articles are there. Um, and actually, just today, I launched my own podcast. Uh, so it's uh, booklaunchshow.com um, and I have the first three episodes up and I'm basically sharing a lot of my launch strategy in more depth uh, and I'm also working on three different launches right now for clients and so I'm going to kind of share in real time what we're working on and you know the process there. Uh, so yeah, that's where they can find me. There we go, Tim Grohl. I told you he had a nice voice, a nice uh, melodic US uh, accent. And he's getting very interested because we're learning from each other. He's become an expert in many areas, but he's he knows Facebook advertising is a big area for him and he needs to move, learn more about it. So actually, well, he's taken our course. He has taken our course, mm -hmm. yeah. And in, uh, at the time we recorded the interview, he'd just started it and was really enjoying what he was learning. So it'd be interesting to tap into him. Uh, to see what difference that's made on his career because someone like Tim with his abilities and his focus Facebook advertising could really be a, a again a kind of blue touch paper moment for for him and his books um, but yeah really valuable and interesting juxtaposition with your own experience of launching you've become a bit of a ninja at launching so um, people are getting a, a hopefully good value out of listening to both those interviews yeah yeah so he, yeah, he is he does know his onions as we say over here when it comes to to launching and I, I love the way he breaks it down into you know influences and, and and list members and cold traffic and all of that kind of stuff is exactly what I do yep. just with a different um, a different way of describing it so yeah really really useful I'd recommend people check out his his um, his books and also the yeah the podcast is really good as you say for someone who's focusing on craft there aren't that many podcasts I think I can only think of another one um, that, that focuses on actually writing the book. Most of the time, it's about the the, the things that you do afterwards. We we tend to focus on marketing, um, yeah. with you know also obviously bits of pieces of other stuff as well. But um, for actual craft um, focused podcast, that's probably the best one out there at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And uh, what I found interesting about Tim's interview is uh, because we also a lot of our focus is launching online courses. I felt a lot of it was relevant to that as well, talking about the influence, what type of people you're mm -hmm. aiming your marketing at and who are going to uh, be the people you aim at. I thought that worked across the board, not just for books, um, but for other things as well. So yeah, really good. Excellent, thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, we're gonna mention our vault again. Uh, you can say it out loud. I can say it out yeah, loud, yeah. So we, we've, as James mentioned last week, we've put together um, all of the transcripts, um, so we've had transcripts all the way from the start for two reasons really. It's great for SEO, so it helps people to find our, our podcast, uh, to have uh, those transcripts on the website. And also, of course, it's we get lots of people who say they prefer to read. Others say that you know they, they may be um, hard of hearing and would prefer to, to read than try and listen to the podcast. So we've always had those available. But I, I just thought that we weren't really using them to their full effect. We've obviously, it's not cheap to get those, get the episodes transcribed, so we'd like to use them a bit more effectively. So what we have done is put together an ebook um, of um, all of the transcripts, or almost all of the transcripts, a couple that weren't relevant, we've, we've dropped out. They've been edited, the show notes are in there, the uh, the links, and of course, as an ebook, it's all searchable. So rather than um, Googling um, and trying to find what you want, you can search, if you're interested in an episode on selling to Apple, for example, or on Apple, you could go to that episode and then using your device or even you know on your computer, you can then use the search function to find out when we're talking specifically about Apple. And, and that goes for anything else that you're looking for as well. So we have that available. It is completely free. You don't need to pay us a, a, a cent for that. It's available for nothing. And you can get it at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash vault. That's V-A-U-L-T, vault. Correct. You did that rather nicely, considering you 
hesitantly whispered at me as if I it was my job to do that. <laughs> um, it's about time you pulled your weight as a co-presenter. <laughs> Talking of pulling weight, look at the man sleeping. He should be pulling up. Sorry, did you pulling the fan. For, for I, listeners, I should yeah, uh, yeah, just I should interject there that, that James is talking about Mr. Dyer, He's not the other side uh, of not the me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I never. Director. Saw. If you do want to see our, our ugly mugs, you can go to YouTube uh, and look at our self-publishing formula channel. Did you yawn? while I said that. I heard yawning. Um, and uh, not only do you get the Vault ebook at uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Vault, but of course at our main website, selfpublishingformula.com, you can download all our previous podcasts. Great. Thank you so much indeed for listening, for being with us. Hope you enjoyed Tim Grohl's interview. We will speak to you again next week. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.